Genesis chapter 27 was all about the family drama and conflict surrounding the bestowal of the birthright from Isaac unto his sons. He intended to pass the birthright on to Esau, but God defeated his plan and God acted in accord to what he had prophesied decades before, or what God had declared, maybe I should say, that the older would serve the younger and that the younger son Jacob would receive the birthright and have a measure of favor in God's unfolding plan of the ages that Esau would not have. After all that conflict and drama in Genesis chapter 27, now we come to Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob flees from an angry Esau, his brother who had vowed to take his life. So let's pick it up here, Genesis chapter 28, beginning with verses 1 and 2. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So verse 1 tells us that Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. By now, Isaac had resigned himself to what he knew was the Lord's will all along, that the older would serve the younger, and that Jacob, not Esau, would receive the birthright, as God had said would happen before these boys were ever born. You can go back to Genesis chapter 25, verse 23 for that. Isaac therefore sent Jacob on with blessing, and with instructions. That's what it means. He charged him and he told him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. It was essential that Jacob obey his father in this <clears throat> and not receive a wife from the Canaanite women as his brother Esau had done. You see, Jacob was the one to inherit the birthright and carry on the seed of the Messiah. Therefore, Isaac sent his son Jacob far away to the east, to the land where his grandfather Abraham came from, to the land where uh, Jacob's mother came from, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, uh, essentially to find a wife among his cousins, the daughters of his uncles, uh, the daughters of his uncle there in the land of the east. Now, picking up in verse 3, Isaac is going to grant the blessing and the covenant of Abraham to Jacob. Look at this. It's very significant. This is what Isaac pronounced over Jacob before he left. He said this, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Badam Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Before Jacob left, Isaac brought him in before, and without the deception, without the savory food that was meant to imitate what Isaac, excuse me, what Esau would uh, hunt in the field, without the hairy suit to imitate Esau's hairy, you know, uh, body, he just straightforwardly pronounced a blessing, the blessing that God intended to be placed upon Jacob. And he says, starting in verse 3, Isaac saying over Jacob his son, May God Almighty bless you. The first section of this blessing, I think we can regard as a general blessing of prosperity upon Jacob, blessing him in the name of God Almighty, that is in the Hebrew, El Shaddai. Verse 
Now, that title, for God was previously used in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, where God described himself to Abraham with this phrase, God appeared to Abraham and said, I am El Shaddai, I am God Almighty. I find it fascinating that now Isaac uses this phrase in bestowing a blessing upon his son Jacob. And we could say that Abraham passed the knowledge of God as El Shaddai onto his son Isaac, who now passed it on to his son Jacob. And not only does he say, may God Almighty bless you, giving a general material blessing, a general blessing of prosperity. He also says in verse 4, and give you the blessing of Abraham. You see, after the general blessing, Isaac then gave the specific blessing of Abraham upon Jacob. That is the covenant blessing made to Abraham and to his descendants. We find that back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, Genesis chapter 15, verse 8, Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. You see, this was the aspect of the birthright that Esau, the brother of Jacob, despised, but Jacob would gain it now. Though, to be honest, Jacob also seemed to be unworthy of such a blessing. Nevertheless, Jacob would be the one to inherit God's promise to Abraham. God selected this one man, Abraham, and made a covenant with him. That's in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And then following throughout, God renews the covenant, restates the covenant again and again with Abraham. And Abraham had several sons. He had a son born through an Egyptian servant named Ishmael. But the covenant would not pass to Ishmael, but it went to Isaac. Nor did it go to any of the other sons that Abraham had through his second wife, Keturah. None of those other sons, but one son, Isaac, received the covenant of Abraham. Then Isaac had two sons. And the covenant would not pass to both of those sons, but to only one of them. God chose Jacob and not Esau to inherit that covenant. Now, what's going to happen, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit in the story. Jacob is going to have 12 sons, and the covenant will pass to all 12 of those sons. But that's another phase. We'll talk about that later. But even as Abraham was promised by God, again, this is in Genesis chapter 12, verse uh, 1 through 3, Abraham was promised a land, a nation, and a blessing, so Jacob was specifically promised. Friends, there's no doubt about this. This is the formal transference of the covenant that God made with Abraham, from Abraham to Isaac, now to Jacob. You see, God promised Abraham a land, and in verse 4, Isaac uses specifically this phrase, that you may inherit the land. God promised Abraham a nation, And in verse 3, Isaac told Jacob that you may be an assembly of peoples. That's talking about a nation. And God promised Abraham a blessing. And in verse 4, Isaac used the phrase that God would give you the blessing of Abraham. And that he would give it, as Isaac said, to you, meaning Jacob, and to your descendants with you. Now, look, let's be very straightforward about this. Jacob was not worthy of this blessing. We can talk about Esau not being worthy of the blessing, and that's true. But neither was Jacob. You see, each of the four parties in the drama, in the conflict of passing on the blessing that we saw back in Genesis chapter 27, Isaac, Rebekah, Esau, Jacob, all four of them, they all acted in an unspiritual way manner. But the amazing thing was that God brought good out of all of it. This was, as you could say, a triumph of God's sovereignty and furthered his previously declared will that the older would serve the younger and that the younger would be preferred. The younger son of the twins, Jacob, and not Esau, would receive the covenant of Abraham. So after all that, verse 5 says, So Isaac sent Jacob away. 
Jacob would travel eastward to the region where his mother Rebekah was raised. He would not see his father Isaac again for more than 20 years when Isaac was truly near death. Now, in response to all of this, look at what Esau does, starting now at verse 6. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padam Aram to take himself a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padam Aram. Also, Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Isaac went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife in addition to the wives that he had. It's so interesting to me now that verse 6 tells us that now the blessing and the birthright seemed important to Esau. They weren't important to him before, but but now for some reason it's like, no, I want this. I, I'm sad that I've disappointed my father. I'm sad that I've lived outside of the will of God by taking these Canaanite wives. I, I want to be like Jacob who refused to take Canaanite wives. And, and the blessing and the birthright were now important enough to Esau that he was determined to impress his father by marrying non-Canaanite women when he saw that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother. So Esau avoided the Canaanite women and married a woman from the family of his uncle Ishmael. Uh, not technically a Canaanite by any means, uh, but really this is just sort of damage control a little bit by Esau on his part. Because Esau had previously married Canaanite women, uh, much to the disappointment of his father and mother. So now, Jacob is on his way. We pick up the text here in verse 10, where we start reading, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to the heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So Jacob traveled eastward towards the ancestral lands of his grandfather Abraham and his mother Rebekah. And as he stopped for the night, using a stone for a pillow, verse 12 says, then he dreamed. Friends, I don't know. Maybe if you use a stone for a pillow, you're likely to have some dreams. But Jacob had a significant dream that wasn't just from his mind or his consciousness or whatever phrase you want to use for that. This was something from the Lord. Jacob had a significant dream in that desolate wilderness. By the way, you can only imagine the strange flood of feelings that were present in Jacob at that moment. The fear, the loneliness, the isolation, the excitement, the anticipation. This was a very important time in Jacob's life. And what did he see in the dream? Well, verse 12 tells us, A ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to the heaven, and there were the angels of God ascending and descending on it. You see, in Jacob's dream, there was now access to heaven. <laughs> there was a ladder between heaven and earth, and that ladder was being used. The angels of God were ascending and descending on it. You see, Jacob now knew that God was closer than he had ever before believed. And Jacob understood now that there was real access and real interaction between heaven and earth. This is the God who came to meet Jacob, but a God who reaches down from heaven and makes some kind of way for humanity to access God in heaven.
And this all was typified by the ladder that Jacob saw in his dream. So Jacob sees this, that there's a connection between heaven and earth that he never before understood, that, that God had somehow set this connection. And God was, in a sense, inviting Jacob to come and to use this connection. Jacob, I've made a way for you to come to me. Now, Jesus, of course, many centuries after this, made it clear in John chapter 1, verse 51, that he was this access to heaven. Jesus is how heaven comes down to people and by which people can go to heaven. Jesus, the Messiah, is the ladder. Let me read to you John chapter 1, verse 51. And Jesus said to him, these are the words of Jesus, Most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Well, Jesus is very plainly referring back to this occasion here in Genesis chapter 28, and he's saying, I am the ladder. I am the point of access between heaven and earth. I am the one that the Father has sent down so that men and women can come to heaven. Friends, Jesus is is the way to heaven. You could say accurately so that Jesus does not show humanity a way, as if Jesus was pointing to a way. No, Jesus is the way. He said that they would see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He is the ladder. He is the way. You know, Jesus said, in his upper room discourse, the night he would be betrayed, the night before he would be crucified. He said this in John chapter 14, verse 6 to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What a remarkable and profound statement of Jesus. And before Jacob understood any of this being fulfilled in the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, that blessing of Abraham that would uh, become a blessing to all the nations on earth, before he understood any of that, he saw this in this vision of the ladder between heaven and earth and the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Then, beyond the picture, the, the vision, the image that he saw in this dream of this ladder standing between heaven and earth and the angels of God ascending and descending upon it, then God directly spoke to Jacob. Look at this, starting now in verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. What a powerful passage. Now understand something here. God made direct and powerful promises to Abraham, Jacob's grandfather. God made direct and powerful promises to Isaac, Jacob's father. Now, Jacob does not merely receive the inheritance of those promises, though that would have been precious enough. Now God speaks directly to Jacob and reinforces those very same promises, that very same covenant that God made with Abraham and passed to Isaac and now to Jacob. It all begins with these critical words in verse 13. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Isaac. 
Now, Jacob had certainly heard of the great God who appeared to Abraham and to Isaac, but now this same God met Jacob in a personal way. This was a life-changing experience for Jacob. And friends, I, I don't know if you've encountered this or observed this, but it certainly is a phenomenon. You know, you, you think of a godly uh, mother and father, husband and wife, and they have a real relationship with God. Maybe something that began in their earlier years, but they've walked with the Lord and, and, and they, they've uh, had children. And they want so much for those children to have their own vital relationship with the Lord. And they do the best they can to pass on a living, breathing relationship. But there has to be something, some aspect that is experiential in the life of the child themselves. Where God goes from being the God of my mother and father to being my God. To, to being the God that my mother and father put their trust in, and I have been blessed by, to be my God that I trust in. My God that I have received great blessing from. This, I won't say that it's the only, but it's a key transition point in the life of Jacob, where God reveals himself to Jacob, personally to Jacob. And what a, what a life-changing experience this was for him. God promised him, again, this is in verse 13, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. These words were for comfort and for hope to Jacob at this critical crossroads in his life. You could say that God repeated to Jacob the terms of the covenant that he gave both to Abraham, again, you'll find that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and to Isaac. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 26, verses 2 through 5. You see, previously, Isaac, his father, told Jacob the covenant was his. That's earlier in this very chapter, Genesis chapter 28. But now, the voice of God himself confirmed it to Jacob. Even as God had promised Abraham a land, a nation, and a blessing, you'll find that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now, in verse 13, God specifically promised Jacob a land. God specifically promised Jacob a nation. In verse 14, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. And God specifically promised Jacob a blessing. In verse 14, God says, In you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This covenant of Abraham was not only passed on, so to speak, from the authority of Isaac, his father, to Jacob, but by the very authority of God himself speaking directly to Jacob. And to confirm this, God said to Jacob in verse 15, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. God promised to protect, to preserve, to complete his work in Jacob. Friends, what good would it do for God to make such dramatic promises to Jacob of a land, a nation, and a blessing, uh, carrying on the same promises that he made to Isaac, the same promises that he made to his grandfather Abraham? What good would it be for God to make those promises to Jacob if Jacob dies along the way in this journey to the east? If Jacob never comes back to the land that God had promised? No, God said, Jacob, not only do I give these promises to you, but I'm going to protect you. I'm going to preserve you until these promises are fulfilled. You could say that God gave to Jacob the same kind of promise that was later found by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. This is what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Again, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Friends, God will continue to work until his work is complete in his people. And that's what he promised Jacob. Jacob. 
But the greatest promise of all, perhaps, was that simple phrase in verse 15. Behold, I am with you. God promised that he would give Jacob bread to eat, clothes to put on. But the great promise was that he would be with him. Friends, if God is with you, what else do you need? That that is such blessing and protection and comfort and strength and endurance all wrapped up with the presence of the Lord. I think it's very interesting to see in the life of Jacob how God's blessing and faithfulness to Jacob can be seen in the several ways that God's presence would be described in Jacob's life. In other words, God declared his presence, or his presence is described in several different uh, phrases in the book of Genesis. So here, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, God said to Jacob, Behold, I am with you. That describes present blessing. And by the way, the indescribable blessing of God's presence. Now later on, In Genesis chapter 31, verse 3, God told Jacob, I will be with you. Now that describes the wonderful promise of God's future presence and blessing. And isn't that a gift from the Lord? It's one thing for the Lord to say, I am with you, which is a tremendous blessing. But when God promises, I will be with you, as he promised to Jacob in Genesis 31, 3, Well, that means God will be with you in the days ahead as well. And then, in Genesis chapter 31, verse 5, Jacob had a testimony. He said this, The God of my fathers has been with me. You see, here he could look back over his life and tell the story of God's faithfulness and presence with him. And then finally, when he's bestowing blessing upon his sons, Jacob said this. He said this in Genesis chapter 48, verse 21, when he's bestowing blessing upon his own descendants, he says, God will be with you. This was Jacob passing on the blessing of God's presence to the next generations. What a beautiful declaration of the presence of God with us in the present with us in the future, with us as we look back over our life, and with our descendants as we pronounce the blessing of God over them. Now, what does Jacob do in response to this marvelous blessing from the Lord? Look now, starting at verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Jacob rightly sensed the presence of the Lord at that place. Therefore, he says there in verse 16, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. However, i got to make a little bit of a correction here for you. If Jacob thought that God was in some places, but not in others, well, he was wrong. I mean, as King David would later say in the history of Israel, in Psalm 139, he would say at verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? King David understood that God was everywhere. So it wasn't wrong for Jacob to say, the Lord is in this place. But in a sense, it's because the Lord is in every place. Many years ago, I was on my first trip to Israel. And on my first trip to Israel, I had the opportunity to go to the Western Wall, that famous wall of prayer where observant Jews take the opportunity to pray. Now, it's not only observant Jews who pray there. There's Christians and, I suppose, uh, people who don't believe in God very much at all. They also like to go to that Western Wall and lay a hand on the wall and pray. 
And I remember very vividly uh, going there my very first time and expecting to experience some overwhelming spiritual uh, experiences. The, the presence of the Lord would surely uh, manifest itself, if nothing else, in my feelings. And I would have just such a great sense of God's presence as I laid my hand on the Western Wall, as so many other faithful people had done through the generations. And, and there I would be just there with them, with my hand on the western wall praying now i remember walking up to the wall you know i was wearing the the head covering that that they provide and as a show of respect there and there i was at the wall and i laid my hand on it and i began to pray and i'll tell you what i have felt i felt absolutely nothing nothing matter of fact it was almost dramatic or demonstrative that i didn't feel anything it was almost as if God wanted me to feel nothing special at that moment. And I, I, I just kind of sought the Lord about it. And I really believe that what God was saying to me was that, David, I'm not, any, I'm not here with you in any greater measure here than I'm with you in California where you live and have your daily life. I'm with you all the time. You don't need to come to a certain place to experience the presence of the Lord. I'm with you all the time. And i got to say that was a very uh, special experience for me. Reinforcing for me that, yes, God can meet his people in a particular place, but God is not more in one place than another. But surely, because of this experience, we understand how Jacob says at that moment, as he declares in verse 16, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he very rationally says after that in verse 17, how awesome is this place. From Jacob's unspiritual and perhaps even superstitious perspective, he put a lot of emphasis on a particular place. He, he didn't really seem to realize that if the presence of the Lord was not with him in every place, then God could never fulfill his promise to him. Jacob, it's wonderful that you're experiencing something powerful from God in this place, but you're moving on eastward. God has to be with you in every place, not just this place. But that particular place, verse 19 says, that he called the name of that place Bethel. Now, the city of Bethel, would play an important role in Israel's history, though not an always glorious role. Among the cities of Israel, it is second only to Jerusalem in the number of times it is mentioned in the Old Testament. Later, when God spoke to Jacob, he would refer to himself as the God of Bethel. That's Genesis chapter 31, verse 13. But sadly, Bethel would later become, eventually become, a high place, a, a place known for sacrifice to idols. That's in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 32, Hosea chapter 10, verse 15, Amos chapter 4, verse 4. Bethel later became an infamous place of idol sacrifice. Now, at verse 20, Jacob's going to make a vow unto God, where we read, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat, and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all of that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, in verse 20, where Jacob said, If God will be with me. My understanding from the commentators I read, the, the Hebrew scholars, uh, apparently that can be translated since God will be with me. In other words, it, it, it's a little hard to say exactly whether or not Jacob intended, God, if you'll be with me, then I'll do these things for you, or whether or not he said, since I know God will be with me, this is what I'm going to do for the Lord. But, but knowing Jacob, I think it's likely that he meant it in the sense of, if God will be with me. You see, God gave Jacob a promise, 
Yet Jacob here is trying to bargain with God. You could say he's even promising God money if he fulfills his promise. Lord, if you fulfill your promise, if you bring me back to this land as you said you would do. But by the way, it's interesting that Jacob's eye was always on coming back to the land, that he understood that he was not moving to the east permanently, even though he would spend more than 20 years in the east. He understood that he was coming back to the land. And this is what he said. He said, God, if you'll fulfill your promise and bring me back to the land, then Lord, I'm going to give you 10%. Now look, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be generous with God and to give God a tenth, a tithe. Th that's an appropriate measure of generosity as is seen in the scriptures often. But, but it's never to be done in the sense of sort of buying off or paying off God. Well, God, if you'll scratch my back, then I'll scratch yours. Lord, if you'll bless me, then I'll bless you with some money in return. And the whole kind of approach of Jacob unto God here, this approach saying, okay, God, you made me a promise. Now, if you'll fulfill it, then I'm going to treat you right. Then to me, the way Jacob prayed made it evident that God's mere word was not enough for him. Jacob had to see God do it before he would believe. Now, the people of God today should not be the same way, but they often are. You know, God says things like this. In Philippians 4, 19, he says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise. That's a promise for us to receive. Now, in context, that promise in Philippians was made to God's generous people. But, but in context, when God's people are generous as God commands them to be, then God will provide for their needs. Now, that's a promise to believe and to receive, not to bargain with God about in Nahum, the prophet, the minor prophet, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord says this, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Th that's a promise to receive. Y you don't have to say to God, Now God, if you'll actually be a stronghold for me in the day of trouble, if you'll actually know me as I put my trust in you, if you'll do these things, then I'll give something special to you. That's not how it works. We should believe these promises of God even before we see them in our life. But that doesn't seem to be the heart of Jacob here. Here in Genesis chapter 28, verse 20, he said this to the Lord, If you will keep me in the way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on. You see, Jacob spoke as if he could set the terms of his covenant with God. In his thinking, he's making a deal with God instead of humbly receiving what God said would be the arrangement. I just get the sense with this, friends, I, I don't know what your sense is as you read this and consider this, but I just get the sense from Jacob's conversation with God, starting at verse 20, that Jacob wasn't very submitted to God. Now, in the next season or phase of his life, as he makes his way to the east and finds a wonderful wife, and deals with his uncle Laban, God will teach Jacob submission in adversity. And he's going to teach it to him through his uncle Laban. Nevertheless, here we see Jacob making a vow to God. That's how this whole section begins in verse 20. Jacob made a vow. And I want you to think of the contrast between God's promise and Jacob's vow. God's promise was, as you might expect, was centered on God himself. Jacob's vow was man-centered. 
This was God's promise to Jacob, found in verses 13 through 15 of Genesis 28, which we're considering right here. This is what the Lord said or promised to Jacob. I am the Lord. I will give to you. I am with you. I will not leave you until I've done what I've spoken to you. (laughs) How focused it is on what the Lord will do. And look at Jacob's vow to God in response. Now, these phrases are all from verse 20. If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, give me bread to eat and clothing. And now in verse 21, so that I come back to my father's house. Friends, again, we see that Jacob, despite having this real revelation from God in both the dream that he received of the ladder between heaven and earth, and and, and both in the direct word that he received from God, Jacob had real revelation from God, but he's still very much focused on Jacob and not focused on the Lord. You know, instead of making this vow that's kind of bargaining with the Lord, it would have been much better if Jacob had prayed something like this. Here would be my suggested prayer for Jacob. Now, look, I I say this from hindsight. It's easy for me to say this. I, I, I would probably find myself praying much more like Jacob than I would like this ideal prayer that I'm going to suggest. But here is a suggested better prayer for Jacob to pray. How about this? Instead of, Lord, if you'll do all these things for me, then I'll do something good for you. What if Jacob prayed like this? Lord, because you promised to be with me, and to keep me, and to provide for all my needs, and to bring me back to the land which you swore to give to my fathers and to me, then I will be completely yours, O God. You see the difference? Instead of saying, well, Lord, if you do good by me, then I'll do good by you. Instead of that, it's saying, Lord, you've promised these things to me. I believe your promise, and because you've made that promise, I surrender myself to you. Now, as lacking as I think Jacob's response to God was, as flawed as I think it was, God was gracious enough not to take his covenant back when he saw such an unspiritual response from Jacob. Instead, he was still willing to be called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, as he declares himself to be in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Friends, aren't you happy that when God does something wonderful for us and we don't respond in the best way, maybe not in the worst way, but not in the best way, uh, maybe with a lot of self mixed in there and not a lot of looking to the Lord, we don't respond to God in the best way, Aren't you God that, that happy that God doesn't just wipe his hands of us and move on? But he's patient with us, just as he was patient with Jacob. Friends, we see in the life of Jacob a very flawed man. Yet God still used him. God still worked with him. And I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of hope that God will complete his work in me and in us despite our flaws, as we keep our focus on him. Now, before we leave Genesis chapter 28, let's consider a few ways that Genesis chapter 28 points to Jesus Christ. We like to do this as we walk through the Old Testament. Just consider, how does this point to Jesus again and again? I I would say this, that, that the entire Old Testament is not about Jesus, the Messiah, but it certainly points to Jesus again and again and again. And we we like to look for these places where the Old Testament points to Jesus. So let me suggest three ways that Genesis 28 points to Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus is the one who left his home to seek a bride in a distant land, even as Jacob left the promised land to gain a bride. That's what we see Jacob doing, do we not? Jacob was sent by his father, 
to go seek a bride in a distant land. And by analogy, is that not what Jesus Christ, God the Son, did? Sent by God the Father, he went to a distant land to earth to gain a bride. And the Bible tells us that by analogy, the people of God, the church, is the bride of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Even as Jacob was sent by his father to a distant land to seek a bride, even so, uh, Jesus Christ came to earth, sent by his father to seek a bride. That's number one. Number two, we see that Jesus is the blessing of Abraham. Do you remember what God told to Abraham? That in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Well, that blessing would come through none other than Jesus Christ himself. It is in Christ the Messiah, the Savior of the world, as John chapter 4 says, that all the nations of the earth are blessed. And later on in the book of Revelation, where we see this glorious scene around the throne of God, where there are people from every tribe and tongue and nation surrounding the throne of God, it's only because of the redemptive work of Jesus that some from all the peoples on earth find salvation and find their way to heaven. That's number two. Jesus is the blessing of Abraham. And then number three, obviously, we mentioned this before, but I'll just repeat it again. Jesus is the ladder between heaven and earth. That was mentioned back in verse 12 of Genesis chapter 28. But we remember the words of Jesus. Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus directly says right there in John chapter 1 verse 51 that he is the ladder between heaven and earth. And we praise God for it. Friends, you can only have one way to heaven. There's only one ascent to heaven, and it's by Jesus Christ. No other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You have to come by the ladder, by the path that God has uh, sent unto us. And that's Jesus Christ himself. I hope that you've done that. I hope that you've put your trust in who Jesus is. This is what you need to do. You need to put your trust in who Jesus is. And what I mean is by uh, the real Jesus, the Jesus that's given to us in the Bible. Not a make-believe Jesus, not a phony Jesus, but the real Jesus you need to put your trust in. And you need to put your trust in who he is and what he did to rescue you. That includes his whole life, all of his teaching, but especially what he did in his sacrificial death and in his glorious resurrection. Believing who Jesus is and what he did for you, especially in his death on the cross and his resurrection, friends, that's what opens up the path of salvation. That's how you walk up the ladder to heaven, so to speak, not by things you do but in the Savior upon whom you trust. You know, if you ever think about it, when you walk up a ladder, every step is an expression of trust. I trust in this rung. I trust in this rung of the ladder. I trust in this rung. Friends, that's how you have to get to heaven upon or through Jesus Christ, trusting in Him all the way. I pray that you have done that. And if not, you can do it right now. Father in heaven, I pray if there's any among our viewers or listeners who have not yet put their trust in Jesus Christ, in who he is and what they've done, especially what he did at the cross as a sacrifice for sins and at the resurrection as a glory of the triumph over sin and death. Lord, if there's any viewing or hearing this who have not yet done that, Lord, would you move upon their hearts to do it right now and put their trust in you. You are the way to heaven. Thank you for that, Jesus. We pray it in your glorious name. Amen.